how do you build a long-term sustainable startup? What people just don't realize is, is, is change takes time. And so there's just limits to how much change can happen in one, two, or three years. I mean, as consumers, we feel it happening fast, but, but a lot of stuff tends to build up over time. And so Salesforce has been doing this for 20 years. And I saw some stat that says, you know, the vast majority of software, 50, 60% of software is still sold under a perpetual license model. And it feels funny because we're buying SaaS predominantly, right? But there's just, there's a lot of inertia, there's a lot of history you know, that, that takes time to change. And so we're 20 years, and Salesforce has passed their 20th anniversary, and, and it's still like this. And so you need time to, 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 to change things. And so if you can find a big idea that takes time to change and build a startup against that idea, right, then, then, then you've got that runway, right? It's kind of finding the biggest wave so that you can surf the longest period of time, and then your job is just to kind of stay on that wave, right, and, 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 and not fall off. From ProfitWell Recur, it's Protect the Hustle, a show about those in the trenches actually doing the work. I'm Patrick Campbell. And I'm Neil Desai. And on today's show, how subscription titan Teen Zo drove Zora to become the Cadillac of the subscription economy. Subscriptions are all about relationships. And we say that a lot here at ProfWell because it's, it's such a fascinating time where it's the first commerce model in the history of humankind where the way that you make money is baked directly into the relationship with that customer where it's not just converting and selling them a gallon of milk or selling them a newspaper or selling them, you know, a perpetual licensed piece of software. It's all about not only acquiring that customer, but retaining them into the long term. And if that relationship goes sour, all of a sudden they're not going to be there and they're going to churn out. Right. And subscriptions have basically taken over our world. Um, there's all types of subscriptions. I'm sure you have some weird ones. Do you have any, or I shouldn't say they're weird, but do you have any kind of subscriptions that you wouldn't have imagined existed 10 years uh, ago? 10 years ago? Well, I definitely like my subscription hot sauce, but I think the, my most favorite is my subscription underwear. Oh, you got a MeUndies? Me yes, or there's a few around? of them out okay. there, but I like MeUndies the most. Why is that? Well, first of all, the experience is phenomenal, right? You got okay. a great selection, great mobile you know, interface. Um, and every month I've got this delightful package to look forward to. Uh, and over time, I've you know, accumulated a few pairs and it's just a good community. It's a community. Yes. Your underwear subscription's a community. You won't understand, Patrick. <laughs> I won't understand. Did you just like, okay, boomer me? Is kind that of. what just happened? Okay. I, I want to spend an hour talking about what you just said, but we have more important things yes. to do. And that in particular is to learn from Tinzo, the CEO founder of Zora, who I'm just going to put it out there is quite literally the godfather of the subscription economy, not only because Zora and Teen basically define that term, which we're going to find out in a little bit here, but also because Zora rode the market and defined a lot of the market when it comes to the subscription economy through Zora subscription management system and work with, you know, a lot of the Fortune 500 in terms of their subscription transformation, but, you know, hundreds and now over a thousand different customers in the world of B2B, B2C or D2C now, however we're defining that, um, as well as media and a lot of other worlds of subscriptions and some pretty weird, I'll put in quotes, subscriptions that we're going to find out in a little bit. Um, but what I'm most excited to learn from Teen today is really the fact of how well he's been able to position Zora within the incumbent wave. Um, and I think he learned a lot about that from his early career at Salesforce. Mm -hmm. um, he was employee number 11, I believe, yep. right around there, um, basically doing sales calls with Benioff as well as, you know, kind of hanging out and really developing not only the sales and marketing motion there, um, but ultimately the positioning as well. And so if you can't tell, I'm super excited <laughs> about Teen just it's because special, I think yeah. there's there's so much to learn. Um, and he even wrote the best-selling book on the subscription economy. He wrote the book on subscriptions um, called Subscribed, which if you want to get your own free Free copy of subscribe. Make sure you listen to the end here. We'll tell you how to actually do that. But with that, I think the first place to start is really to understand where Teen comes from. You know, where he came from in terms of what was his upbringing, where that career kind of came from, working at Oracle, Salesforce, a bunch of other places, and then ultimately learning, you know, his approach to, you know, creating such a powerful brand and a powerful product in Zora. So let's jump in. I grew up in, uh, in New York City, in uh, call it the 70s and 80s, right? So a little different uh, New York than, 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 than these days, pre-internet, pre-tech, uh, pre-computers. And so I was probably one of the part of the generation that discovered the PC as a kid and uh, started playing with it. 
and kind of fell in love with technology from there. I think we have a mutual acquaintance, Bob Allman, Rich yeah. from the Full Armor yeah. crowd. Like, was that your first job back in the day, or was that? Yeah, taking it back here. So, so that was probably um, one of the, you know one of the first exposures to entrepreneurial roots. A bunch of us went to Cornell, Cornell University. Uh, I was in the engineering school, and uh, you know, Rich was in the hotel school. Right, I got to make fun of Rich for that. But he had an entrepreneurial streak. And so a bunch of us actually started a software company. And Danny Kim and, and I, the W guys, uh, were, were the developers, programmers. Uh, Rich and Bob actually went door to door on Wall Street trying to sell it. And you know, this is pre-internet, right? So, so sales were primarily literally door to door. So they went around Wall Street trying to sell security software on, 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 on an IBM PC. Pre-Windows, it was, it, was, it, was, it was MS-DOS. The software product actually made files disappear. And so you can, you know, store a bunch of files on your five and a quarter inch floppy disk, run our software, and the files would disappear. And people wouldn't know it exists. Run our software, and we would put it back again. And so it was, uh, it was a piece of security software. What happened after that? What was the next step after that? You know, Rich ran with it. He's still running the company, a uh, successful company years and years later, uh, decades later. Um, you know, I decided I wanted a little bit more exposure to corporate environments, and I wound up at, at, at Oracle Software. I joined Oracle in 1990. There you uh, go. In New York City. Oracle, Salesforce, Zora. In many ways, uh, you know, Benioff Salesforce is, is, is the son of Oracle. And so, so we're probably the third generation. I'm sure Larry loves that, that yeah. way, how you just described that, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. What was it like in the early, like the earliest days? Because a lot of people, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the first, you know, SaaS company. It was the, the first one to, like, just yeah. get huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what, what was it like in those early days when it was, like, you know, 11 of you, like, you know, going on sales calls? It was like, great. You know, what was nice about Salesforce, uh, and it's not unique, but we all had a shared singular vision. Uh, the first 30, 100 employees, right? We, we all were disillusioned by enterprise software. We all loved this thing, new thing called the internet. It was brand new. And we were all trying to figure out, right, how to, how to use the internet to change what we didn't like about enterprise software. And so it became a singular focus and, and it allowed us to sort of weather the storms that happened afterwards, right? So the dot-com bust, you know, but like, you no, know, we're still delivering what we're doing. We're still delivering value. And so we were kind of shielded from that. A lot of the industry was pressuring, you know, the early software as a service companies, right, or whatever they were called back then, to allow the customer to install it on premise. And that just didn't make sense to us, right? That, 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 that wasn't part of the vision. That wasn't part of the mission. And so it was easier for us to, to, to reject that option. I don't know how many sales people came to us and said, this Fortune 500 company would buy the software if we let them install it. And uh, up and down the chain, including support was from Mark. We were just like, no, we don't really want to do that. How do you maintain that like relentlessness about these certain aspects? You have to take it back to 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 the vision. Take every conversation back to a cohesive vision. You know, it's not easy. And you know, were there decisions at Salesforce that, that we made that 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 probably we regret it because it was went too far? Yeah. Decisions we made at Zora that we regret that probably went too far. Yeah. But but it's an iterative process and you want a feedback loop and, and taking every decision back to, hey, is this going to advance our vision? Is it going to allow us to get closer to our vision? Or is it taking us off our vision is, is, is the fundamental question. Can you imagine what it must have been like that early at Salesforce hanging out with Benioff? No. <laughs> I want to. I want to say, yeah, sure, uh, but no, I I can't imagine. I mean, these are the godfathers and godmothers of our of our industry. You know, these folks who were that early at Salesforce, and yeah, there were other SaaS companies. You know, Constant Contact actually was founded very very similar time frame, and you know, there's a bunch of other you know industry heavyweights that came out of that period. But if you look at folks like Teen and other folks who were early at Salesforce, like those were the men and women who basically pushed this entire industry forward. And frankly, what I was most fascinated by what Teen just said was this insane singular focus, Yeah, you know, not coming to, you know, having the sales folks come and basically be like, hey, we, we need to do this on-premise thing. We need to sell it in a perpetual way. That's where I could close this Fortune 500 company. And them going, no, that is one of the core things that we are trying to destroy. We will not bend on that particular piece. And going through the dot-com bust and still having that singular focus and that vision, I think that we can't say enough about how like important that is. I think for a lot of companies and, and obviously for the success of both Zora and Salesforce. Totally. And I think that's where you see this birth of like the subscription economy really come. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, as we, we're about to find out, you hear it all the time. We talking about well, it. We hear about it from Zora <laughs> yeah. all the time. Right. 
every single thing they published, subscription economy, subscription economy, subscri they actually trademarked subscription economy a long time ago. It's one of those things that there's just such a singular focus on it. And I think that we appreciate it, us being in this industry, we're like the next generation of company that's, yeah, the subscription economy, obviously this is where everything's going. Therefore we should, you know, kind of latch onto it. But I don't think we appreciate Zora being around for 10 or so years now just how much in 2008, 2009, and before that, this whole concept of the subscription was so new. It was very similar to this whole SaaS thing that Salesforce was trying to do back in 1999, 2000 era. And so what I'd love to do, and, and there's just so much on the vine here that we're going to be able to hear from Teen about, I'd love to first jump in and like, what does he define as a subscription economy? Why is it so important? And then ultimately go into practically what Zora did in order to kind of push this market forward or ride the wave of this particular market. So let's jump in and hear from Teen about what is the subscription economy, which I know seems obvious, but there's some good nuance here. Yeah, and what exactly, I mean, subscription economy, you guys talk a lot about this, obviously. We do. Um, evangelizing, understanding what that is, like, what, what is it? You know, for folks who don't know, for folks who don't understand, like, the concept, like, give it, give it to us here. Well, you feel in your personal life, right? You, you probably, if you just pause and think about it, you are actually buying less and less stuff, right? You don't need to buy cars or CDs or DVDs or newspapers anymore. When you have needs around entertainment or work or food or transportation, more and more we're just reaching for our phones and we're accessing our favorite ser services. Maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's, it's, it's Salesforce, maybe it's Spotify, maybe it's Uber. And so we call the shift a shift from a product economy, which has really dominated you know, the business world, if you will, our own world for the last 150 years to something new. And we call that a subscription economy. And it's really uh, the delineation between the first and the second is really this whole concept of the end of ownership, that you don't have to own things anymore. Instead, we prefer to use our favorite services. Yeah. And that's kind of where, where we are and where we're, we're definitely like amplifying. Yeah. What do you think really drove that? Like if we go back you know, the 80s, you had sort of subscriptions in yeah. some cases, and we've had subscriptions for like hundreds of years if you really yeah. look at like some retail products and things like that. But like, what do you think really pushed us from going from, you know, on-prem perpetual software, you know, one-time purchases in a store sure. to yeah. like this world where yeah. we don't own anything? Well, if you look at it, um, uh, what pushed the software sector to really going from selling products to selling services, right? Services in the cloud, so to speak, that we just simply point our browser to and subscribe to. Uh, and it is the internet, right? The internet is, is, is at the root of so many changes in, 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 in our lives. But when things are connected, right? When, when, when you can connect to cloud-based services, uh, it makes more sense for companies, like software companies, to deliver it in a centralized service and allow everybody to take advantage of it and everybody use it. It's just a much, much better economic model. Right, you don't, you know, should, people shouldn't have to buy servers or sits around idle. You gotta have a whole IT department. People used to say that 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the IT budget was just spent keeping the lights on, right? And that was because of all the servers and all the backups and all the databases, and that's just all, all gone away. And uh, and this is starting to apply to sector after sector after sector. Now the first wave, where I would say, were the digital sectors, right? The information economy, so, so publishing as an example, right? Really, really had this transformation. Why buy a book? Just access it online. Uh, the general media industry, whether it's news or, or, or movies or TV shows or, or songs, music, right? Really, really went this route as well because it made a lot of sense. But the reason we're so excited about this is we're about to see, uh, we're seeing right now, the whole physical world being transformed as well. Well, so, so if you buy a, a washing machine today, chances are it's connected to the internet, right? Chances are you can, you can see what your washing machine is doing right now, right back at home. Uh, if you garage door openers, right? Cars, every car is coming off the assembly line. Virtually every calendar 2020 model is going to, uh, is going to be connected to the internet, right? And it's already censored up. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing ball bearings, we're seeing porta potties, we're seeing medical devices. Uh, we're seeing floors, we're seeing floors and tables and chairs really all, all connected to the internet as well. And so that same thing's gonna happen where, where if it's connected to the internet and it's collecting all this data and it's sending the data to some cloud-based service, then you can see the engineers all of a sudden are gonna put their focus right, on developing cloud-based services to take advantage of all these smart devices. And so we think our world has been transformed, but we, we ain't seen nothing yet. Because when every physical product really just becomes part of a broader service that's delivering you food or entertainment or transportation, 
uh, you're going to see a completely different world. Yeah. One thing that I've always admired about Zora is like the evangelism of the subscription economy mm -hmm. because I think that there's a lot of people who are like, oh, like, oh, this evangelism seems so obvious now. It's, it's like when Zora started, this was not as obvious at all. Sure. Like, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, the transition, especially to, you know, why this over, yeah. I'm sure there's tons of opportunities you could have either joined after Salesforce or that yeah. you could have started yourself after Salesforce. Well, in many ways, this, this, this idea was a, a continuation extension of Salesforce, right? And, and, and Salesforce, um, you know, we always talked about two transformations, and Mark added a third, which was the philanthropic side, right? And you can see that's pretty important, and, um, and he's, he's, he's very focused on that these days. But he talked about a new technology model, right, what we now call cloud computing, right? And before that, we call it software as a service, still call it software as a service, and there was a whole collection of terms in the early days before we landed on these things. But we also talked about a new, a new business model, right? And the business model was subscriptions. And so the nine years of Salesforce was evangelizing both those things, right? It was, it was you know, technology, cloud, multi-tenant, right? Metadata-driven customizations, right? All the words are stuck in my head, right? But, but why does the pay-as-you-go model make sense? And, and especially when we went public to Wall Street, with Wall Street, um, Wall Street had no understanding of this. It's like, well, why would you, you know, instead of taking a million dollars up front, take money over time? That doesn't make any sense. You're just going to go out of business. Uh, of course, they're not saying that these days, right? They, they, they understand the model. And so in many ways, it was taking the evangelism uh, of really both things and saying, you know, we've been evangelizing for the software industry. What if we can evangelize this for every single company, mm. right? And, and, and that has been the continuum. That's chapter two of the work or part two of the work, if you will, which, uh, which is now we evangelize this in the media industry. We evangelize this in the manufacturing industry. Healthcare is being transformed. Utilities are being transformed. We're seeing a lot of signs of financial services Right, is being disrupted. Um, you know, we're sitting here October 2019, and, and, and just in the last 30 days, both Fidelity and Charles Schwab have announced you know, no-fee transactions. Right? I mean, you were around in 1999, 2000, some of this stuff is, is, is coming back, but, but, but there's a permanent shift that's going on, and, and it's all because of this, 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 this shift in consumer behavior of wanting, you know, not wanting to buy products and, and simply wanting to be served. So obviously I buy subscriptions, right? Our entire business is predicated on subscription. Yeah. You both subscription buy subscriptions economy. and you buy the notion of a subscription economy. <laughs> right. Neil buys a lot of subscriptions. Uh, so I'm just going to throw subscription that Subscription hot there. sauce too. Highly oh, recommend. hot sauce. Love it. Um, but I, I wonder if it's Zora that sort of forced the market or if this was something that was going to happen anyway. Well, that's an age-old question, right? Can you force a market or is it something that just kind of you're, you're actually riding a wave? And, and I think that really Team just gave us insight into – the answer to that, which is he saw the shift or he and others saw the shift where he talked about, you know, Salesforce, there was, you know, two big aspects. And then ultimately this whole payments concept is, is really the, the concept that pushed things forward. And I think that that's, that's something that is really, really hard to understand is that I think that Zora certainly spent a lot of money to advertise what was coming and so they might have had some power in pushing the market forward, but less around pushing the market forward and more around defining what the market is and defining all of the things around the market. Educating you on this is why a subscription or a recurring revenue or some sort of business with a value metric makes more sense than a perpetual license. Hey, this is what's coming and this is how you should define your income statement. This is how you should define your pricing. This is how you should define some of these things inside the market. But I don't think that any company has the power to truly create the market. Um, and I know that's a little bit of a controversial thing and it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg, but I would argue, and, and I don't know if Teen agrees with this, I think based on what he said, he would agree with this, that they're really defining the market, not necessarily creating the market. Interesting. So when we think of like category creation, you're saying the category, given given the infrastructure costs and given how easy it is to start SaaS, uh, subscriptions would have happened anyway. Zora sort of defined. Yeah, because if you, if you really think about it, I, I think category creation it define it, it, it it's it's your positioning in the context of a market that's being like coming coming to fruition, right? It can't just this be is, you. <laughs> this is a very like yeah. capitalist view of the world, I'm sure. But it's one of those things where you're defining your positioning in the context of that market, and then you're fighting to be the definition of certain things, right? So Zoro is fighting, at least in my opinion, to define what it means to be a good subscription management system. And honestly, like defining the things around that, like what you should measure, how you should measure it, all of these different things. That's what Zoro was fighting to do. But Zoro wasn't fighting 
fighting the market. They may have been a bit, little bit early, but this is also why they needed to raise a ton of money is because they were in the early stage of the market and then they're basically buying the mind share and the positioning within that market as we're going to find out in a bit. But I think this is really, really important to even go deeper on because if you really think about the subscription economy, where it comes from, and Teen kind of alluded to this before, is really the measurement. So if you think of like the shift from perpetual software to kind of cloud-based software, and this, you know, for some of us, even you, like you don't remember perpetual software. No. I barely remember perpetual software. And it's one of those things where that was a huge shift that it took technology. Like we didn't have AWS, we didn't have, like we had an AWS version, IBM even had that back in like the 80s, but it was so astronomically expensive, it was only used by governments and you know very, very big, large institutions. But what ended up happening is basically, you know, Salesforce in that kind of SaaS 1.0 world basically was like, cool, we now don't have to, you know, sell in this particular manner. We can sell and build this type of product. Now, over time, we basically have been able to start measuring things properly. We can measure the ball bearings. We can measure the amount of miles you're going on a car. And we can very easily get that data into the cloud or get that data back into the billing system. And then we can actually charge on those particular things. And so that's where, yes, we're in the middle of that market market kind of being created and we're still, you know, or maybe past the infancy, but we're in the adolescence, right? And there's going to be some products where we're like, that's a subscription, really? And you're hearing all these people kind of complain about, oh, I have too many subscriptions. Is there going to be too many Disney pluses and Netflix? Like, no, because what's going to end up happening, at least in my opinion, is you're going to be able to kind of see that more transparently. You're going to get the more receipts. Your bank is going to make it easier for you to see these there's things. There's tools to manage your subscriptions There's now, tools right? to manage. There's going to be to tools that pop up. There's yeah. going to be all these different things. Yeah. But that doesn't, it's not the subscription's fault. Right. You actually are like the subscription because. So you don't buy subscription fatigue. Uh, no, I don't buy subscription fatigue at all. Interesting. I think, I think there will be fatigue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be, but I think it's one of those things where, to, to give you some context, like we're even thinking beyond subscriptions at this point. Because, you know, you think of the Black Mirror episode as one of the first ones where you buy the individual piece of toothpaste in order to brush your teeth that day, right? Like, that's, that's where the world is going. And you see this in DevOps products, right? And you can kind of see that market develop over time where, you know, it's not necessarily going to be a subscription, but it's going to be predictable revenue. Now, it's going to take another, you know, couple of decades for that to, to be, you know, super prevalent. But that, you know, in, in light, that's kind of a subscription because you're probably not going to, like, actually swipe the credit card every single time you use it. You're probably going to, you know, batch that into a monthly, you know, subscription that's just going to fluctuate over time. And that's where I think, you know, Zora is riding that wave of subscriptions being created. And there will be a little bit of backlash because there will be a couple things that maybe this subscription isn't set up properly, but there should be a true subscription. And then all of a sudden the measurement and the transparency is going to come and, and, and that's going to help us get over the fatigue. But I am, I am not teen. I am yeah. not the godfather of the subscription economy because that's really who he is. So I'd rather hear his opinion than my opinion on this, particularly because I think that he has seen some fascinating subscriptions. And he actually at some of his events and dinners has a really fun game where, you know, people try to stump him on things that um, should or shouldn't be a subscription. Yeah. And then he always has an analog of, oh, here's this subscription that you might not know about. And he'll reveal those, a couple of those in a second here. But let's go over to Teen to not only define, um, you know, is there subscription fatigue and what are all the crazy subscriptions out there, but also get a few pretty crazy subscriptions. What's kind of your thought on not only like what can or cannot be a subscription, which maybe everything can, but also on like what that transition is going to look like when we have some things that maybe just aren't ready for a subscription and then eventually become one? Well, I joined Salesforce.com when it was 1999, right? It was about 11 people. I was 11th employee. And uh, people forget, but just to kind of bring back what 1999 was, right? If you watch TV shows like Fresh Off the Boat, you, you kind of see that, but, 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 no, no one had Wi-Fi at home, right? We had a U.S. robotics 56K modem was the state of the art, and we would dial into the internet. There's no Wi-Fi in hotels, right? So Salesforce, we were literally asking, you know, road warriors, salespeople to go back to the hotel room, unplug the phone, uh, the cord off the phone, plug it into their compact brick, right? It was, you know, it wasn't, was, it wasn't a Mac Air, right? It was a compact brick. And, uh, and then, you know, hear the whirling noise as they dial in, see the screen, scroll down, Right? There, was, there was no HTML5, there was no, there was no CSS files, right? Like my product managers would hand code 
what the pages look like, right? In uh, uh, just in HTML themselves, right? That's how easy it was. And um, and so it was just it was, it was it was a very very different world. And the next nine years that I spent at Salesforce, a big part, you know, my role, whether in product or marketing or strategy, was was evangelizing the idea. And we heard all sorts of stuff, right? This stuff is not secure. Like, why would I trust putting my customer data? into your servers, right? And I prefer to keep it on my servers, right? Or it, it can't be customized, or I can't integrate this. How, how am I possibly gonna integ integrate this with, with my, my SAP, my Oracle, whatever my, my internal systems were? And so we just heard objection after objection after objection. This thing is only gonna be for small businesses. Oh, this thing will only be for tech companies, right? The government's never gonna use it, right? And so, and, and you just see that it plays out. Right? And, and these are all solvable things. And so, so we had to solve how to, integrate, but we did, and we had to solve how to make the cup, the product much more customizable, and we did. Uh, we, you know, we obviously had to solve security, and because of the centralized nature of it, you know, we can invest so much more in security than any individual company. Mm. And so, you know, when the world eventually realizes this, then, then the adoption really, really starts to shift. So subscription fatigue, right, I, I think we're just in a state of change, and people are trying to process the change. Mm. Right, but 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 none of this is it changes the underlying factor that this this is where the world is going. I heard you sometimes at dinners have a little bit of a game of yeah. stumping yeah. subscription. Yeah, subscription, subscription stump the chump. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. What's the most like ironically successful subscription you know that you've seen? Like one that you were just like I like it's weird. No one would expect this is a great subscription, yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like you know a great business. Well, uh, I mean, our minds have been blown uh, over and over again. I mean, every quarter I'll hear two or three stories. You know, we wrote a book called Subscribed, uh, you know, bestseller out there. And, and what inspired us to write the book were these stories. I mean, we were just see mind-blowing stories of companies really, really, really taking advantage of the subscription business model, both you know, startup disruptors and existing, you know, com we, we, work, we work with companies that are 200, 300 years old that are transforming into, into subscription businesses. And, uh, and we, you know, we wanted to put these stories together as an inspiration, but also draw out the common elements of it, right, for, for everybody to learn. So, so subscribe, you know, recommend the book, Amazon.com and all that. Um, you know, but, but if you think about it, thinking through history, you know, we used to think industrial equipment, right, big, heavy tractors, um, you know, four ton, five ton, 10 ton things. And then Caterpillar came along, and, and it's been a, just a huge success story with Cat Connect and you know, two million assets, they call them assets in the field, and, and, and today well, virtually all of them are connected to the internet. We used to talk about, you know, I remember the first meeting when my account teams came in and talked about a flooring company, floors, right? And, and containers were hot at the time, it was like, okay, containers, this must be a new technology, floors, and it turned out, no, 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 they, they sell physical floors, smart floors, right, sensors underneath the floors. You know, a few quarters ago, we had a company that made porta potties, and it's like, well, is that a smart porta potty? But it turns out, right, that, that, that the, this business model is actually a long running customer relationship, a long con running contract with lots and lots of changes. Mm -hmm. There's lots of add on products like, like, like showers and, and, and fences, right, because they're selling to parks and yeah. things like that. There's also a usage based component, right, because, you know, the thing is, is, is used, right, and, and can be measured. You know, this quarter we've heard about um, ball bearings. Right. Apparently, there's a company out there with two million smart ball bearings that are detecting load and, and, and vibration pattern. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at first I was like, so are you buying like ball bearings by the batch? That's what I was just thinking. Yeah, what is exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because no, they're smart ball bearings, and I didn't know it was possible that you can make a little metal ball. Smart. Well, I guess like friction. You know, knowing if the friction, friction is too much vibration, is and load. Yeah, Those yeah, are the yeah. two two big things. That's cool. And they want to get to 50 million smart ball bearings. And so, you know, if you think metal balls out there can be smart in collecting data and throwing it out there into the cloud, then um, Anything could be. Nanobot Smart. subscription at some Nanopi, point. Yeah. Yeah. Nanobot, yeah. Nanobot subscriptions, yeah. Iron Man, yeah. I can't wait. So I think this makes sense, right? Like, over time, the ability to measure things have gotten better. Back in the day, we couldn't measure ball bearings or caterpillars. That's so ability wild, to, right? I, it's yeah, incredible. Yeah. The caterpillar thing I can kind of believe, right? Because it's such heavy cost equipment. Yeah. Uh, but, but the ball, ball bearings, bearings thing, yeah. I, I mean, it, I, I, I can't even, I, I want to look into that, but I don't know. And the porter potty thing, I think made a ton of sense as yeah, well, yeah. because it's like, I don't, I don't want to buy those things. And my, my only thing is like, what's the difference between renting and subscription? And, and frankly, I think a lot of Zora's kind of cheeky uh, positioning is, you know, it's, it, it, it's not different. Like it's the same thing, but it's always, whenever I see the cars, like there's, so, there's a lot of cars now, BMW, I think is doing this. That, well, it's, 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 it's a subscription. <laughs> yeah. It's not a lease. So yeah. like, what is the difference yeah. there? I think it maybe comes down to the contracts yeah. or it's like the default end to it, right? When you're yeah, renting, yeah, yeah. there's going to be a term length or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So that, that's, what's kind of fascinating. But, but I think ultimately 
uh, this, this is basically the point I was trying to make, which is, you know, there's, there's so many things based on the measurement now and Zora as a product, that's where the measurement comes. But now I want to shift things a little bit because I, I think it's fascinating. Obviously it's cool that Zora put this together, uh, or at least kind of rode the wave here mm -hmm. and is continuing to define all those pieces around the wave. But one thing that I think that people don't appreciate about Zora, uh, it is one of the best, if not the best enterprise sales teams on the market. Really? Uh, one of the best. People talk about their decks, people talk about their sales processes, and it is not an easy product to sell. I would argue something like a CRM is a hell of a lot easier to sell because your TAM, your total addressable market is yeah. just like not any business, but a lot of different types of businesses. And people get it. A subscription management slash billing system, that is something that's super, super hard. And so they have one of the best sales teams. I think even though, even though they are an enterprise B2B company, their marketing and their positioning is just brilliant. And I think it's one of those things that they they really focus on the go-to-market and they really focus on all that positioning. And so what I'd love to do is learn from Teen on how we in our respective markets, not only us as ProfitWell, but also any other company that's listening, any other executive that's listening, can actually learn these lessons from Zora about how to define a market, how to push a market, and define all of those pieces around the market, because I think that's really where we can you know, earn our stripes today. So let's dive in. When you think about your role, like either in, you know, as an exec at Salesforce or here, like how do you market? How do you go to market? Like if you were teaching a course on this, like what's the syllabus in terms of like what you have to focus on, what you have to care about, and like how do you, you know, win in those markets? I think there's, there's two things, right? There's one aspect of it, which is how do you build a long-term sustainable startup? What people just don't realize is, is, is change takes time. And so there's just limits to how much change can happen in one, two, or three years. I mean, as consumers, we feel it happening fast, but, but a lot of stuff tends to build up over time. And so Salesforce has been doing this for 20 years. And I saw some stat that says, you know, the vast majority of software, 50, 60% of software is still sold under a perpetual license model. And it feels funny because we're buying SaaS predominantly, right? But there's just, there's a lot of inertia, there's a lot of history you know, that, that takes time to change. And so we're 20 years, and Salesforce has passed their 20th anniversary. And, and it's still like this. And so you need time to, 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 to change things. And so if you can find a big idea that takes time to change and build a startup against that idea, right, then, then, then you've got that runway, right? It's kind of finding the biggest wave so that you can surf the longest period of time. And then your job is just to kind of stay on that wave, mm -hmm. right, and, 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 and not fall off. And so there's that aspect. Now, in the day-to-day -day details of what do you do from a marketing perspective, now, I think marketing is, is ultimately um, about um, positioning. Right, and, and what is positioning? And so you go to B school, and the, the simple classic thing is is you know price and and, 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 and you know cost and, and, and value, cost efficiency, right? And there's some curve that you're trying to put, and that's just a simple model, right? With two dimensions. The reality is there's an infinite number of dimensions that we're making choices against, and marketing is understanding those dimensions and trying to highlight to the customer which dimensions are the most important. All right, and so Salesforce, it's, it's, look, you can spend all this money on Siebel, um, but that's just a waste of money, right? What you really want is you really want ease of use, you really want convenience, you really want agility, right? Right now we're going through a phase where uh, SAP and Oracle might be good for scale, but they're not good for agility, right? And so you can see we're trying to define two dimensions and, and, and put us on a map, right, in terms of positioning. Those guys are about scale or about agility. Which one do you want? seems like the modern world really requires you to be agile. That is the essence of marketing. And then good marketing then is able to bring that out through storytelling, right? And so how do you, how do you communicate these things through stories? Because as people, as human beings, we absorb things primarily through, yeah. through stories, right? And yes, we need facts and figures, but the facts and figures has to support a broader story. When you were at Salesforce or even with, with Zora, scale versus agility, like how do you, how'd you pick that? Is it, you know, Arguing amongst the team, researching, finding well, ideas, like how do you how do you find like that's that's the thing, and it probably changes too. Like how do you know when to change? Or, so you or, know when somebody is a marketing when um, as a marketing mind when when and this is something I had to develop myself. I don't know that I was it was born with it or, 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 or was trained by it. You know, early in my career, is they're constantly testing. They're constantly testing because they're looking for input. They're looking for a lot of data, 
And so I remember, you know, one of my stories is, um, uh, this is like two or three months into, into, into Salesforce, right? still a small company, less than 30 people. Mark comes out and says, going on a sales call, who wants to go with me, right? And he points at me and says, okay, and so I'm like his SE on the sales call. I'm gonna do the product demo and all that. And I was like, I'm going on a sales call with a guy who has a reputation of being a great salesman. So he's like, let's, let's go check it out. It's my first, you know, probably my first sales call with him ever. And, you know, lots and lots have followed. But um, I remember him going to the meeting and I had expectation that he would, uh, he would pitch, right? Like salespeople, here's why our product is great. And he would, you know, and he didn't do that. He spent the whole time asking questions. Uh, and, and it was just bizarre questions too. It's like, well, what do you think of the color? What do you think of the color scheme? What do you think of the tabs? What do you think of the name? What do you think of salesforce.com? Is that the right name? You know, what do you think of this thing about like making it as easy as, 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 as buying a book on Amazon? What do you think of the word accounts, contacts, opportunities? It's the whole time he was just asking questions and uh, just bombarding. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, uh, he was like, okay, so Tina will give a demo now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so it was a different approach and you could just see he's constantly asking questions, probing, and trying to understand what's going on out there. And so, that's, so you eventually start to form a picture in your head, but it requires you just to, to, to kind of ask a lot of questions and, and, and explore what's out there. And do you, as, as you're asking those questions and kind of like figuring out, hey, it's agility versus scale or, or whatever it is, like is there a point, there's a point where there's, it's not always like one obvious thing, or it's like rare, it's like one obvious Well, you probably have tested thing, 50, right? 60, 70 things, yeah. right? And you see the ones that resonate. Yeah. And you're also trying to interpret, you know, and, and they're not gonna say the words to you. It's like, okay, well, what are they really saying? Yeah. What do they really need, right? And yeah. you just, you just constantly test it. How do you figure out if you're wrong? Oh, well, you'll know. I mean, the customers, it won't resonate. I mean, another, uh, you know, Clarence So, he's still at Salesforce. Um, I remember he was one on um, the early product marketing, he ran product marketing. And we were launching Enterprise Edition. Mm. And, uh, you know, first SaaS company, right, you know, ever to launch multiple editions and now standard practice. And, 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 and we were trying to figure out how to do that. And I remember he, he, uh, he pitched the first 50 customers, wouldn't let the salespeople pitch. He was like, well, let me get on the phone with them and talk about Enterprise Edition. And he would try this and try this and try this. And it was probably about 50 pitches, about three to four weeks later, he, you know, he came back and he's like, I think I've got it, mm. right? And he's like, well, what is it? He's like, I think it's about customization, integration, and security. And as, you know, and I'm taste testing. I was like, no, that, that, that sounds right. That sounds right. You've distilled all our conversations down to, to three things. Another story, uh, you know, it's out there, but, but, but when, when we started uh, Zora, how did the word subscription economy come about is, is, is the question I, I get sometimes, right? You know, we trade market, it's, it's our thing. You know, I had this fuzzy story of, of disruption. Salesforce disrupted Siebel. Uh, Zipcar is gonna disrupt GM. Right, and you know, it took Uber to do that, right? But, but the, the story is still the same. N uh, Netflix was disrupting Blockbuster at the time, right? Because it's still DVDs and uh, being mailed out. And, and so I, I spent 15 minutes, told a reporter friend, uh, Tom Tolley, right? Tom, if you're out there, right? And uh, Tom came back, uh, wrote an article, and the headline was Powering the Netflix Economy, right? Because he, he associated Netflix with subscriptions. As soon as we saw that headline, I was like, that's, you know, that's it. You know, he boiled it down to a simple, simple headline. And we were just, you know, we struggled a little bit of like, well, we can't call it Netflix, right? And, you know, you're gonna get sued, right? So, 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 so we played around with a bunch of things and eventually landed on, on subscription. I think that was really fascinating, specifically how he talked about positioning Zora in the early days, right? Because like, it, it's it's not easy, but I, it, and it sounds pedantic now looking back, but the subscription economy was, I, I think, really powerful in the way that they defined it. Yeah, but I think that the way that they defined it, and, and he used a couple of anecdotes there from um, both Benioff and Salesforce, as well as um, the the reporter who kind of coined Netflix economy that they, they, they then kind of took subscription economy from, where it really came down to that building that long-term startup. I think what ends up happening in a lot of organizations is that you essentially have like a founder, a mission-oriented, maybe investors, um, or just a, a founding team, and then all of a sudden things start to kind of snowball forward, and you lose some of that core. Yeah. Um, you're like, hey, this is exactly what, what needs to happen, and then just you expect everyone to kind of like take that on. I think the experimentation that Teen kind of talked about, which is really finding that core essence and then making sure that with that core essence, 
that everyone is executing in the same direction. And then it comes down to not only making sure that everyone's aware of it, but also having the right team and that team kind of executing things forward. And it comes back to, you know, a very, very common theme that we see with when we interview these folks, which is, you know, people, people, people yeah. being like so, so important. I mean, I think that alignment is even more important because in order for Zora to have the, their place in the subscription economy, product, CS, sales, everyone needs to be bought into this mission yep. uh, for them to get there, right? Yeah, 100%. It's all about that people. The one thing that I may challenge, though, is that like the first 100 people are bought into the subscription economy, right? It's hard for me to see that they all saw mm. that at that time. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, as, as let's say I'm wait, 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 wait. No, 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 not really that they that they because I don't I don't know if they coined the subscription economy in the first hundred people. You know, you kind of talked about that where you need to kind of focus on that, but you don't think the first hundred people saw this whole oh, we're, we're focusing on this shift, whether the words were a subscription economy or not? I, I think maybe. I think it, it was, it's hard. It's easy to say in retrospect, like, how it was all perfect, right? I, I would well, argue I'm sure that, it wasn't like, perfect. As a, pro, as a first product person at Zora, uh, I, I don't know if it was that, that clear that the shift was happening in the world and, and they were going to power thousands of subscription businesses but I don't, 10 years later. Well, I, I, don't think, I don't think Teen is saying oh, the first 100 people have to know you're going to be a success because I'm sure Teen, like every founder, had days where he was like, oh, I don't know <laughs> if this is going to be successful. But I think his point is more the first 100 people have to be on board. And I think that's a really, really important thing where whether they realize it just naturally from their previous roles or they buy into the mission based on the interview process, the onboarding, et cetera, I would argue that more companies would be successful like Zora if they had their first hundred people all on board with the mission of where things are going. And I think that you see a lot of companies where, you know, they kind of flounder because they just have the wrong people. And it's a very common story where people get to $10 million, which is roughly around where you might have, you know, 70 to 120 people, depending on your funding structure and your revenue and these types of things. And then all of a sudden they just flatline. And there's a lot of reasons that they flatline, but one of the big reasons that they flatline is because you now have a situation where the CEO and the founding team can't be the ones evangelizing things. They need those 100 people. And so I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying <laughs> right. it's perfect, but I'm saying that his advice around those first 100 people is probably very, very prescient to create a really successful company, especially one that was on the VC warpath and everything like that. I, mean, I like think this Zora speaks to, to his leadership, right? I mean, he, he saw the first wave of that, not only at Oracle, but then again at Salesforce. Totally. And he, he knew what he was up against. I think uh, creating that alignment and, and culture the, of, of, of that mission from the early days really went a long way. Well, and I feel like there's it's very rare that a CEO, like maybe Benioff. Yeah. Like Benioff is a super boisterous, charismatic guy. Teen is, he's, he's charismatic, but he's not boisterous, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that even Benioff... You know, I wasn't there. Teen was obviously there. There were other people there. Like, if there was only, you know, one Benioff and everyone wasn't on board, like, Salesforce wasn't going to be successful. Do you think you have to have a leader like that if you're trying to define a category? That's super tough. No, I don't think... I, 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 I want to say you don't if you have the right mix of people. I think Teen, obviously, was a good, like, voice and a good, like, mouthpiece or however you want to define this for Zora. But I think that their marketing team, the book that they wrote, all of these different things like really push things forward. If you look at a lot of companies, there at least is someone who's kind of out there. Intercom has Dez, uh, Drift had Gerhardt and a little bit of DC, um, not to use like clear competitors, but there's a lot of different companies that have that. Maybe Slack is a good example of someone that. Yeah, Stuart was out there, but I think, I think you have, it's also a liability, right? Like yeah. we're trying this year to get me less in front of the camera and other people more in front of the camera. That's why you're here just to kind of diversify the brand a little bit. But I think that it's not a good question. Not that it wasn't good, but it's not like a really good question because I, th I don't think it matters. Sure. I think it's more around having those hundred people like push things forward. I think a lot of what they pushed forward was having an amazing sales team and that sales team and moving that pitch. And that's one thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is this teen at the, at the end of the day, I think is one of the best marketing CEOs out there. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think Zora has a CMO. I'm pretty sure they don't have one. It's it's team. And he has a huge crop of people, not on the product team, but also on the marketing team um, and even on the content team who are fantastic at kind of not only coming up with that vision with him, but also executing on that vision around positioning that they've had for a good 10 years now. And I think that's 
that's more important is those people that execution. And that's why I think what you said about the hundred people not being important is dumb. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think it's, it goes a long way to show that the discipline, uh, yeah. Ha, ha, has carried through hundred percent. Well, the and stages. I think the discipline is the most important part. And, and that's what teens about to tell us is that, yeah, having this positioning, like that's cute and all, but really if you don't have the discipline, if you don't have those hundred people, that's where things break down. And so let's jump back in and, and learn a little bit about what teen talks about of having that execution and having the right people and the DNA of the company be so mission oriented. And how do you then flush out the story to then, basically push things forward into the best sales deck out there, the best sales team out there, some of the best enterprise B2B events I've ever been to, and so on and so forth. Let's dive in. Like, what do you call subscription economy? Is it like overarching, like, brand? it's not a brand, it's more just like a... It's market. the most important trend of our time. There you go, there you go. One thing that I really admire about Zora is like, execution, especially on a sales and marketing side, is 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 amazing. Like when you go to a Zora event, doesn't matter, I've been through plenty at this point, doesn't matter if I'm in New York, Sydney, San Francisco, same look, same feel, same language, same like similar content, you know, that's tailored to the audience, stuff like that. Like how do you how do you make sure that execution like down market, because you're not a small company, you know, you're a public company. Like how do you how do you make sure that the execution kind of goes after that particular, you know, message or positioning you're going after? Well it's 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 built into it's built into our DNA. And, and so I think every employee is at the company because they believe in the subscription economy. I mean, a lot of startup and early stage folks or anybody right, really, really make a mistake of trying to go too fast to, um, to, to, to the tagline. You can't really do that, right? You, you want to flesh out the whole story first, and then you have a tagline. Because behind the tagline is the full story, right? And so you hear the tagline, but then, you know, you go, okay, what do you mean by the subscription economy? And then there's a 30-word version, there's a 100 version, and there's, you know, there's the book. Right, which is, you know, whatever that is, uh, 9,000 words or something like that, right? No, more than that. And so the story has to evolve over time, right? And, and the tagline, the 30 word, the 100 word, the book, they all have to line up. But when they do, everyone gets it, then, then, then it, it all starts to make sense, right? And, and if you're telling the story in a way that resonates with us as people versus as, as a company trying to, trying to explain a product, then, then it, it, it winds up being easy to absorb and easy, easy, easy to propagate. What are those elements of like a good story? Because I think you you've there's been a lot written on like the Zora pitch, just very meta articles on like how powerful it is and how good it is. What are the good elements of of that story? You know, I read an article once that says if you boil down all the movies in the world, there's really only like four or five plots, yeah. right? And uh, you know this watching a movie, you know like okay, this is the plot, but you still enjoy it, yeah. right? Because it's 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 the it's the art of how they put it together. And I'm sure there's some exceptions. There's some art, you know, artsy movies that that, that violate, you know, uh, basic plot lines. But that's the essence of it. And so, so you know, I can boil it down to to there's got to be some arc. There's got to be some plot, right? Uh, we talk a lot about if we have customer speakers. We talk a lot about the uh, the hero's journey, mm. right? The hero's journey is always you know the hell and back, right? It is always some kind of uh, you know whether it's Greek myth or, or modern stories, right? If you look at the arc of the industry chapters, uh, the first few chapters in the subscribe book, they really all have the same pattern. It's, it's, the, it's a decline and rise uh, pattern, right? Where, where pre-subscriptions, the world was going to crap, subscriptions really saved it. Now, you know, the technology industry is further along in that, the manufacturing industry is early, but they all have that feel, yeah. but they're all told in a way that's specific to, to that industry, mm. right? There's a, just a general simple pattern of storytelling um, that you kind of anchor on the work is not that. The work is trying to find the essence of the story, right? Find the essence of the plot line. But if you look at our, our marketing meetings where we're, we're trying to figure a lot of our messaging out, we'll reference a lot of pop culture just because, you know, it's all around us, right? Yeah. Uh, the pop culture storytelling. And so it's easier to draw from these type of common, common stories that we all have in our heads. I really like what he said about stories there. Yeah, and again, it's it's something I'm sure we've read or heard before, but the whole concept of there's, you know, you have your positioning, yep. getting the right team with the right DNA to kind of execute on that. And then when it comes to the story, there's only a couple of formats to choose. Put your positioning inside those stories, call it a day, 
right? Which I know is hard, but that's that's essentially what's happening here. Totally. And there's a, a five second version of that story, a 10 minute version and an hour long version, right? And I think that's something really cool about Zora and, and Teen specifically is like you can adapt that positioning to yeah. the context needed. No, totally. And that's that's when people ask, because I do a lot of speaking and a lot of writing when they ask, like, well, like how do you put you know, an hour talk together. Well, you don't start with the hour. You start with the 30 second version, then the 10 minute version, then the 30 minute version. And then really from the 10 minute version, you're just kind of filling in the gaps at that particular point. And so, yeah, I think, I think storytelling is one of the most underutilized pieces. And, and I struggle a lot with this as a team because I think that we think storytelling is just a creative thing, mm -hmm. right? Well, oh, I have to be creative. And it's like, yeah, probably to create the greatest story of all time, but to create a decent, solid story, I think it just takes practice. And we don't have a lot of things within our, you know, kind of, or opportunities within our working, you know, lives to really create those stories. Right. And I think that Zora, again, quote unquote, even though they're an enterprise B2B company, and I say that in quotes because like every company should do this. And normally you don't have an enterprise company that has such a strong storytelling, you know, base to it. I think Zora has done a phenomenal job at this. And, you know, I don't know where Teen exactly picked that up. If it was from Salesforce, if it was from, you know, just his background, if it's just his love of, you know, stories, positioning and branding and marketing. But I think it's a, a pretty phenomenal job just in terms of, you know, what they've been able to do, not only with the subscription economy, which is, you know, synonymous with Zora, but also just with, you know, building a company in, in, in a wave that was coming and a wave that they've defined a lot of. Right. I'm, I'm honestly pumped for the future of like enterprise marketing because when everything looks like a Nike ad. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's coming. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've been to subscribed, I believe, right? Um, you know, and looking at all the fun, you know, stuff that they have and you're walking in and yeah, it's not, you know, CES, you know, but it's because it's very focused as a, as a user conference for Zora, but it's one of those things where it's just kind of fascinating to see what they've done in terms of the branding. And it's, it's somehow is playful, but not unprofessional. So it's still very, you know, blazer and, you know, kind of enterprise salesy, but it's not, uh, it's not kind of stodgy and, you know, you know, up your nose at no, not know, at kind of a weird, <laughs> you know, weird kind of enterprise type sales. What did we learn today? Ownership is declining. Yeah. The <laughs> subscription economy is here. It's here. Surprise. Uh, yeah, but we've yeah. got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. And I think that the, the biggest thing that I kind of took away from this, um, there was a lot of little missives is, is for one, positioning is super, super critical. And positioning is what gives everyone within your organization when they're on board with the mission, basically the, the glue or the vocabulary or the knowledge to basically execute in all of the different things that they're doing on the front line. And I think that Zora, even if they came up with a concept, if they didn't have that other piece around execution, wouldn't have been able to do this. And I think that's the biggest takeaway. And then that's also the hardest thing around alignment um, and the people that you hire is making sure everyone's on the same page. I mean, I think for me, it's like this recurring theme that seems to come up in every one of these episodes is people, right? It, like not only do you have to hire the right people, but aligning them and, and making sure we're all marching towards the same mission is the most important. Thing. And that's ultimately discipline, right? So, you know, team talking about the discipline that Salesforce had not to build, you know, on-prem perpetual software. And Zora, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it wasn't easy when Shopify, you know, is, is growing so regularly and Zora is sitting there and just strictly focused on subscriptions. And that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a long-term play, right? And now they're the, the, the one public, you know, subscription kind of management. I don't know if they like that phrase, but so um, be gentle with me, Zora, <laughs> Zora folks. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where they're, they're the first you know, public one. And they're the, they're the Cadillac in the market. Like I like to say, they are the, the kind of the gold standard, which I think is pretty cool. Absolutely. Cool. Well, that's all for this week on Protect the Hustle. If you enjoyed this episode, if you like this episode, we always appreciate a like, subscribe, or make sure you're signed up at protectthehustle.com. And if you're listening to this and you want Teen's best-selling book, Subscribed, um, which is something that we make everyone who is onboarded at ProfitWell actually read. It's in our it onboarding. Is, yeah. It's in our onboarding. It's such a good primer. Uh, make sure you make a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and send an email to patrick at profitwell.com with the screenshot, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of Teen's book for free. Definitely. We'll see you next week. This has been a Recur Studios production, the fastest growing subscription network out there. 
If you find use for this show, subscribe for more like it at profitwell.com slash recur.